As a pastor, I've been invited into the most intimate settings a family could possibly share with another hospice care, end of life. And in such a room, I can minister to the grieving loved ones with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's such a room that I turn my focus on the person lying in the bed. They're breathing their final breaths. They are thinking their final thoughts. They are hearing their final conversations. I have a pattern of questions for folks. Knowing this is likely the last conversation that they will have on this earth. Are you scared? Are you ready? Do you have any regrets? It is, it is here that I get to see the preciousness of faith and hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ displayed with tremendous beauty. This morning we read the psalmist say, I will not die, but I shall live. This holds a lot of weight and on a hospice bed. And may that very same way fall upon us this morning in this room, that we may rejoice in the wonder of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which Christians celebrate this morning. So if you found your place, Psalm 118, the entirety of it, I will read, this is the holy word of our God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look and triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I, have, I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are the tents of the righteous. The, hand, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray for the Father's help. Lord, with our Bibles open, we have heard your word read aloud. Lord, use your word and match it with your power. That by your Holy Spirit, our minds might be renewed. That our hearts would be stirred for a high affection for Christ Jesus, our Lord. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was at the store this week, and my cashier, who is an older lady, looked upon my giant spiral ham and candy and all sorts of things like paper grass that we buy this time of year. And it's obvious this time of year what exactly I'm doing. So what she does, small chat, you have any Easter plans, she asked. I told her, well, it's the same as every Sunday. 
We're going to church. One thing that's different is dinner. Dinner will be different. She responded, my parents used to hide my Easter basket. And I would say, well, mine too. Um, it, she, uh, we, we, there's so, so many fond memories of growing up. It takes me back as a kid. But I can't help but reflect upon that brief encounter with a cashier. The pain of aging ushers in nostalgia, a fondness for the way things were. But I have learned over years that hope isn't found back there. If anything, nostalgia tends to test the strength of my hope. For hope is in God's promises, things that are mine and things that will be mine. Because as much as I enjoy, even in my own children's eyes, in their youth, I know they have experienced the very same way of all humanity. The pain of aging. The pain of dying. And creating memories with my family is such a joy. But I want those memories to point forward to a living hope. Today is Resurrection Day where we look back at the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. With faith, we look forward to our own resurrection. For us, who have faith in Christ, we look forward with hope. Now in this psalm, we find the psalmist calling for worshipers to gather. So don't just read it as like it's about me, it's about I. This is about gathering God's people to worship God for his great works and for who he is. And in this hymn sung by God's people, we discover two things. One, God's love will not lose grip on you. It's steadfast. It's enduring. It is long-suffering. And secondly, the psalmist praises God with gratitude for his steadfast love. The psalmist sings inviting worshipers to marvel at God's love together, which will not lose grip on his people. His steadfast love endures forever. He says, let all the people say this, from fear. You are to fear the Lord. He is not some sort of cosmic entity in the sky that you can be indifferent about. You know that you're worshiping the Lord rightly when you come before him with trembling. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's big. He's holy. He demands righteousness, perfection. He is just. Then the psalmist gives an example of how God's God's steadfast love had saved him. So once again, let's look at verses 5 through 7. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Because what can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look and triumph on those who hate me. So someone persecuted. And he says, out of my distress. Do you know what distress is? What could grieve your heart so deeply that you would define it as distress? We use other terms in a more modern psychology uh, era that we live in. We call it, I'm stressed, or depressed, or anxiety. A good way to translate this word here actually is terror. Out of the terror of the depths of my heart, I cried. In our sin, we can use out of my distress, out of my being stressed, out of my being depressed, out of my anxiety, out of the terror of my heart as an excuse for sin. I'm stressed, so I did fill in the blank. And you justify it. Well, I can get away with it because you know, I was stressed. Normally this would be seen as a, a bad thing, but it's good to me because it's getting me through a hard time. Notice the psalmist has a greater confidence of his relief. Where, out of my distress, the terror of my heart, the greatest anxiety and depression, can I go and find relief? The psalmist comfort to whom he takes the terror of his heart. I cried to the Lord and the Lord heard my cries for help and has become my helper. The grace of being heard by God. This 
is the great marvel of this psalm. That I would call to him in my distress and that I would actually be heard from heaven. How many distress in this world, but never call upon the name of the Lord. Countless souls grieving in pain, fearing the worst in life and death, but never take hold of the grace of God. That God remains indifferent to them. It's something that Paul warned us about in Romans 1. Where he says, since they, the world, did not, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do whatever what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They, they, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. If that is a great summary of the world, they have been handed over to whatever they want to do, what ought not be done, and then they encourage and pat each other on the back. Oh, don't worry, this is okay. And what has it led to? Well, Paul is very clear. It's a world filled with people bent on rebellion against God. They're released by God. They conspire to suppress the truth of God's holy decree in their unrighteousness. And they believe any lie that mocks the Lord. Oh, look at that guy over there. He's mocking God's righteousness in a great way that makes me feel good. Let us all encourage other what to, do, to continue doing that together. And what at the end is they refuse to glorify the Lord. And the world becomes even more heated, more hostile. Instead of speaking peace to one another, Paul says they're going to return to being gossips and slanderers. There's no peace in the world. There's no true intelligence in the world. Perhaps that is you. You grieve without the comfort of God's steadfast love. These are all just words being spoken by a preacher. You do not call to him in distress, but your distress, you go to many other things. Being stressed leads you to pursue comfort, and you chase momentary things that never satisfies. You believe the lies of the world and refuse to worship the Lord, thinking it an evil or strange thing. Then you will go through life without the hope of any grace, and you will enter your own tomb without the hope of resurrection. But I encourage you to listen closely to what God is saying. Because this is not just an ancient book. Psalm 118 is God telling us something. So look at this in verses 17 and 18. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Now, who can say that? Who can say that with any confidence? I think... Of, of the mourners of the little girl's deathbed laughing when Jesus told them, fear not, for this child is only sleeping. Why is that funny? Why is Christianity funny to this world? Why do they mock Jesus here? Because in a world of only decay and death, people think it is illogical that dead people can raise from the dead. People think Everlasting life is so absurd, it's laughable. This is the Lord's doing, says the psalmist. It's marvelous in our sight. You know what's marvelous? When the dead raise from the dead to everlasting life. God, by his own sovereign might, may discipline us severely, but he has not handed us over to death. You see, death is something we experience and see with our own eyes. It's all around us. Our human experience with death is saturated. Life begins, and its entire existence is so fragile that life becomes less something that Jesus calls abundant and more captivated by death each day of our life. Death haunts us. We have health insurance, life insurance, which is actually death insurance. 
are weighing daily decisions of risk. Why is risk risky? Because you might die. And such haunting of death on our daily experience can only be removed if I am promised from a reputable source of everlasting life. Only he who is mighty enough and everlasting could possibly promise me life everlasting. Human wisdom cannot grasp the concept that a person dies and later in that very same flesh raises from the dead to never die again. We have only seen people die. We've not seen them come back. And so it's funny to a hostile, God-hating world that God would have the power and the mercy to give everlasting life to those who have faith in Christ. But this is what I believe. Jesus died, and in his very same body, he rose again. And we, the church, will have a body like his. The Father raised Jesus from the dead, and that is the seal of his promise to defeat what was impossible for man to defeat, our own death. In his time of distress, Jesus cried out to the Father who heard him. The Father delivered Jesus from the grave, despite the murderous builders who rejected the chosen stone. The Father exalted Jesus, who is the cornerstone. Back in Psalm 118, verses 9 and 10. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord. I cut them off. Now, if we remember Jesus teaching his disciples that the Psalms are fulfilled in him. This Psalm is about Jesus Christ. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked Jesus. You say so. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus claims, my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. So he is saying he's a king. His kingdom is not of this world, but it is in it now as invasive. Pilate and the mob crucified Jesus with this charge written above his head. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, while he wore purple and a crown of thorns, The world claimed Jesus was a false king, someone worthy of being mocked. But it is the world's rulers and it's the world's kingdoms that are falsely in control of everything. The world's kingdoms will all fall. So place no faith in them, says the psalmist. The kingdom of God is forever. Jesus, the king of heaven and earth, will cut off the nations who surround his church. The church may be attacked by hell itself, but hell will not prevail. Jesus rules from his heavenly Jerusalem, which will come down on earth as it is in heaven. In the resurrection of our Savior, we enjoy a victory that gives us hope in all the failures, all the regrets, and all the griefs of this life. Though princes and humanity often fails me, I cry to the Lord in my distress, and I'm freed by his promise of everlasting life. This is God's marvelous act of redeeming us, and it is marvelous in the sight of the church. Now, the world, however, will devise all sorts of ways to redeem humanity. They see it's broken. They see something's wrong. So they go, well, let's try and invent ways to redeem humanity. I ask you, do not listen to them. They are a world of liars. The world may be crafty, but they cannot demonstrate eternal qualities. You want everlasting peace, and you think you're going to get it from a hostile, temporary world? God demonstrates his eternal steadfast love and eternal life, a promise the psalmist believes. Look at verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. God has become my salvation. He has proven my salvation by raising Jesus from the dead. Has God become your salvation? You may be tempted to think lightly about your own wickedness. If you minimize your evil, you will not see God's grace for you in Jesus Christ is amazing. We live in a time 
of the selfie. Not just taking pictures of ourselves. This is fascinating. Where you think, oh, I'm going to go to wild places. And look, there's a picture of me in front of something amazing. And then we do all sorts of different poses. Where did we learn that? We learned that together. But now, with all sorts of filters to airbrush flaws for a peering, judgmental, and hostile world, they look at you with judgment, so we have come up with technology to remove flaws, so we don't feel so bad. I saw once this reel, if you know what reels are, it's okay, social media, it's worthless. It was this one where this family was trying to get these children together, and they're fighting, and he says, and they hold the phone up, and instantly, it's amazing, They stop fighting, turn to the camera, hug each other, and smile. And as soon as the camera goes, the phone goes down, they say, continue fighting together. What a fake world we live in. I mean, all they do is airbrush themselves. They try to remove flaws. They try to make an appearance. Well, if we can make it appearing that we live in a peaceful world, we'll pretend that the hostility isn't there. You know, the greatest slanderers are the ones who accuse other people of slandering. The greatest gossipers are the ones who gossip. And we live in a world of lies. The modern fear here is ignoring someone. The world and all its appearances of glory and beauty and fun is a fraud. Their pleasures, fraud. All they do is lie to one another for approval just to be seen. But what they see is also a fraud and a lie. What they put forward is a fraud and a lie. But I will tell you, God sees everywhere you go and everything you are. He sees you. Not a profile of you. Not an airbrush filter of you. Not a moment in time getting the best pose and background. He sees you every moment, the good and the bad. He hears your thoughts, not just the stuff you want him to know about, but even the hidden crevices of your mind and your heart, even the things that you have been crafty to hide from yourself. The modern fear is if this world saw my flaws, my bad moments, my bad days, my bad hair, the things on my face that are wrinkling, that they won't love me. And I'm here to tell you, it's true, they won't. You try to gain the world's approval, you have to go up by their standards. If you don't conform to it, they will hate you. The the silly thing is, what is driving us to keep going back to the world's approval are the things of the fraudulent things that give us comfort. Our sinful hearts seek approval. We want to be seen. We want love. We want to be loved. And the world's like, well, you can have our love if you conform to our ways. If you will just airbrush yourself. If you just remove the flaws. If you just change your identity. We don't love who you are. We want you to be something else. Then we'll love you. Keep chasing something until we find something in you to love. And you know what? You keep going after one thing after another. And you keep pursuing the world's love. And you never get there. They will abandon you if you don't line up to their standards. They will cancel you if you do not conform to their perfectly to their thoughts and their pleasures. And they will mock you mercilessly over any flaw. But I would tell you, turn around and stop looking at the world and stop looking at yourself. God sees you. The real you. Not a new identity you want to make of yourself for a fraudulent world with a fake approval. But the real you. Your tears, your sorrows, he sees. Your sins, your many, many sins. He sees them all. And no, he does not approve. God's approval rests only on the perfect. Not filters, not poses, not identities. No, the real you must be perfect. But good news. Behold in this psalm. The stone that the builders, the whole world rejects has become the precious cornerstone. Jesus, whom the world box is approved by God. And so are all who in their distress call upon him for help. God has become our salvation. Look at verses 15 and 16. 
Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. His mighty, powerful right hand. Glad songs. That's the church. Glad songs. Oh, that our homes would be happy songs of God's deliverance. His power to save. His mighty right hand. This requires a low view of ourselves. That we are in need of saving. I am wicked. I don't look at the world and say, well, look how wicked they are. I'm the chief of this sinful lot. I'm in need of saving. But it also is dependent on a big view of God who is both mighty enough to save and loving to save. The world's hero, true conqueror, is Christ. He was hero and conqueror by living a life perfectly obedient to the Father and becoming our sin bearer in suffering and in crucifixion. Then the Father raised Jesus from the dead. This is something joyfully to sing about. Let me come down to verses 19 to 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The psalmist is thankful to God. Why? His, God, his gate of righteousness has been opened to him. And all it was, was God's doing. God saves by his own might. The gate of God's righteousness leads to the presence of God. Where in his holy temple, the psalmist goes and gives thanks to God. Our righteous worshipers may come in, but only righteous worshipers may. The gate of righteousness is open only in Christ, who is the righteousness of God. The Lord taught us that he is the gate, but it is narrow. Few find it. Have you found Jesus? Look at me in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The builders reject the stone chosen by God because they hate God. And so out of their hatred of God and murderous rage, did they put their hands upon Christ. Jesus went to the cross, however, willingly, knowing he was despised and rejected. In Matthew's gospel in chapter 26, verse 30, tells us when They had sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. I want you to see this. That night before, he's going to be betrayed. This is the man of sorrows of the height of his sorrows. And what does he do at the closing of his last meal with his disciples? They sing the glad songs of God's salvation. I will not die, I shall live. Now, you might be asking yourself, what hymn did Jesus sing? Psalms 115 through 118. This is the traditional psalm sung at the Passover, Pesach. These are often called the Egyptian Hallel, or songs of praise for Hebrews leaving Egypt in haste at Passover. Now imagine singing with Jesus on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane where our Lord would weep, sweat blood droplets, taking my sin that his blood would wash mine. Though without sin, Jesus becoming a curse for me. The curse of sin upon this sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then you read, bind the festal sacrifice. Up to the horn to the altar did Jesus go. This road to the cross had much weeping in it. In those final days, Jesus wept at Lazarus' funeral. Yet the conqueror of the grave rose Lazarus from the dead. Jesus wept over Jerusalem as scattered sheep without a shepherd. And yet the good shepherd will call out and gather his flock who listen to his voice. Jesus wept at the garden of Gethsemane. That the sin bearer removed all the guilt and gives eternal life sealed as the father rose him from the dead. Back in Psalm 118, look at me at verses 24 through 27. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. The wording here is Hosanna. Save us. This is the shout of the crowd as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the shout of a king's arrival. A coronation is taking place. And as the king arrives, the shout to bind the ends of the altar with the sacrificial cords of the lamb or animal. The place the priest would finger blood of the sacrifice. And he sings, this is the day the Lord has made. Now, join that with what we heard earlier. It's a day of distress. It's a day of weeping, a day of tremendous grief. Surely he has borne all our griefs and our iniquities. We esteemed him afflicted, smitten of God. We turned our faces from him, crucify him. This harkens me to Luke 9, verse 22, where Jesus says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, And be killed. And on the third day raised. The arrival of God's promised king involves sacrifice to God. This day that the Lord has made. But there's great rejoicing. It is the Lord's doing. And King Jesus became the sacrifice. For the joy that was set before him. Jesus endured becoming the curse of sin for us. And the cross, the steadfast love of the Lord is forever. But I love this. Let, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This day the Lord has made is a day of hope. On the morning of Resurrection Sunday, the women spread the news to the disciples that the tomb was empty. They, the disciples ended up eating breakfast at the seashore with Jesus. They ate fish dinner with Jesus in the house. Hence the meaning of this psalm. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is the day of the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. With hope. With resurrection hope. With faith in the steadfast love of the Lord. We may weep this night. But I know on the other side of my own grave, joy comes in the morning. Sinner, Resurrection is not a cliche for those with faith in Jesus Christ. We Christians can say God shined his light upon us from his holy house. We are blessed to come in the name of the Lord. We may weep as Christ had wept, but he conquered all those fears. No charge of sin can stick on a Christian, for God has forgotten our transgressions and cast them as far as the east is from the west. No tears can be shed by the Christian that will not be finally wiped away by our Savior. No suffering or injustice will go unredeemed. For Christ has overcome the world. We may weep tonight while it is dark. But joy comes in the morning. The dawn of Christ's return and the promise from God. His steadfast love endures through all things forever. So I ask you before you leave this morning, will you fully trust in Jesus or will you go trusting yourself? The sinner will go on trusting him or herself for two main reasons, I observe. They think highly of themselves and they think very lowly of God, if ever at all. If you have a big view of yourself, you only run to to circles that cheer you on with cliches. You can do this. You deserve this. You are good enough. And if you have a low view of God, you will not find him worthy of worship on Sundays. Worthy enough to cry out to him in any distress. No, in my distress, I go after me. I encourage you here to have such a low view of yourself to who you truly are. Remove the attempts of filters. Remove the attempts of trying to profile yourself 
You are a creature, and not just any creature. You're God's creature. You will not look into your grave with silly cliches to give you hope before you fall in. Your loved ones will not have hope in the world's cliches when they see you die. But look to God who is big, who hears the cry of those who cry out to him in their distress. Now, for those of you who think this might be harsh, I'm simply warning you with scripture. It's God's holy word. There's no desire in my heart to hurt you. The desire of my heart is to see you take hold of God's promise of everlasting life for yourself. I do not want you to leave this place this morning without true hope that only comes in Christ Jesus. And cry out, Hosanna, save us, Lord. You know, Jesus taught us that all of heaven erupts in rejoicing for every sinner who repents. This very day, this very moment, could have a loud, joyous, raucous shout among the angels of heaven if one sinner repents. All the fears of this world and your grave find their rest in Christ. And Christ is our only hope. And what a joyous hope the Christian has. In the world, however, you will have trouble. And I ask in your trouble, in your distress, that you would come to Christ who is our rest. We can rest in a love that endures all because it is steadfast. A love which will love, which loves and never loses grip on you. We can rest in the one who rested in the tomb on that Sabbath. And with the hope which Christ fulfilled in this psalm, I shall live. What we have read in this psalm, we come to the empty tomb of Christ and are assured that God is truly faithful. Way back in Genesis 3, God confronted Adam and Eve about the fall of sin in the Garden of Eden. And in that very moment, God promised one will be born of the woman who with bruised heel will crush the head of the serpent. This is the promise of the Father sending the Son on a bruising mission. Jesus obeyed the Father with total trust and the Father raised him from the dead. We can trust that God is faithful. That God is mighty to raise Jesus from the dead. He is mighty to save a dead sinner. Jesus lived the perfect life that God accepts, which I could not live. Jesus died the sacrificial death that I could not die. Jesus rose from the dead to give me eternal life that I could not earn. Such grace we can rest in. And the psalmist cried in distress and the Lord heard his cry and became his helper. He has promised such grace, he sings, I shall live. Christ cried in distress, and the Father heard his cry. And I shall live became resurrection. By faith received Christ. In your life and your death, you will always have this hope. I shall live. How? For the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. His promises are eternally true. To the glory of his great name.